Simon Spruill switches to Tesla, GM's ignition switches turn off the public, and do you want high-tech or horsepower? Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone. Your journey, our passion. This is Auto Line After Hours with John McElroy, episode 233 for March 14th. Chuck Thomas, Honda's Cap and Crunch. Watch Auto Line After Hours live at Autoline.tv every Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time or 2200 GMT. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for Autoline in iTunes, Stitcher, or by following the links on our website. Gary Vasilak, how you doing, man? I'm doing good, John. How are you? I'm doing well, and uh, we'll be joined momentarily, we're told, by Brent Snavely and, uh, from uh, the Free Press, and uh, fill us in on what he's been doing on, but uh, you've been out driving Audis this week, yeah, right? Yeah, I was just, just out driving the A3 sedan. That's the proper name of this car, because there is the A3 Sportback, which will eventually get here, because you remember that the A3 used to be the hatchback in the U.S. market, and probably wasn't doing so well. So this is the first car that Audi has specifically designed for the American market. And uh, the designer, Danny Garand, made it very clear that he wanted to make this a three-box design, a classic sedan. He wasn't taking the sport back and sticking a trunk on the back. He wanted to make sure that this was the, this was the kind of cars that uh, Americans look for. And what's your verdict? And from the looks, we'll get into the rest in a minute, but... Oh, I, I think he, I think he did a very nice job with that car. I mean, it it looks sufficiently Audi, mm-hmm. and they they've done a fantastic job on stamping the sheet metal panels. I mean, there are some creases in that, and I was asking him. I said, "Come on, you, you gotta you gotta tell me that when you went to the uh, to the, the the press room that these guys said that you're you're just absolutely crazy. You can't do this." And he said, "Well, at first they were a little hesitant about the whole thing." He said, "But we worked it out." And he says, "Because when we were designing it." You know, we wanted the radiuses to be as tight as we could possibly get them, and uh, and, and they just did a great job on that. It's just just quite amazing. And uh, um, you know, Audi is making a big investment because they're actually building this car in a plant in Hungary. That's the plant where the TT originally came from, in, uh, uh-huh. and and uh, they spent 900 million euro in developing a whole facility that will be making these A3s as well as some other vehicles. That's a lot and, of money. Uh, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of interesting technology that they put in there, laser laser welding for the roof and so on. And uh, But no, I think I think they did a really nice job. And um, But what I think is, is, is somewhat fascinating, you know, you were mentioning in, in the lead-in about, uh, the, you know, getting this on Bluetooth in your car, for the show, um, that when they were unveiling the car to the to the press, um, it was almost like a trade show whereby there were booths from Google and NVIDIA and Qualcomm and AT&T and... and uh, they brought in all the suppliers, they, they brought in tech the, suppliers. They brought in all the tech suppliers and, you know, and they made... But um, Scott Keogh, who's the president of Audi, said... USA. Out of USA. He said, these are tech partners. They're not tech suppliers because what usually when somebody from you know, my side of the world, the OEM side of the world says suppliers, he means getting something at the lowest possible price. He says, we don't look at it that way. You know, these are, these are our partners in developing this technology. And so, you know, this car, which begins at just under $30,000, is, you know, meant to be an entry into the Audi brand. So presumably this means younger buyers who will be more tech savvy and be more interested in getting you know high levels of technology so and audi's now first to market with 4g lte technology that's right, right yeah gm thought they were going to be the first ones to market i, I don't know see i don't think that gm ever thought they're going to be first to market. but what gm is saying is that we are going to put this across our lineup in everything in everything um my understanding is the only everything that they're not putting it in initially, at least, is the cruise, because I think that that's about to be changed. And I would suspect that you'd have some issues in terms of wiring harnesses or whatnot in order to, you know, embed the new uh, um, electronics necessary to do that. So 
GM will be widest, but Audi is first with this, with uh-huh. the Ford, Ford GLTE in it. And uh, so their partner, AT&T, um, moved away from T-Mobile, which had you know been a, a supplier for them. And so um, it's, uh, it's an interesting car. I mean, it's, it's uh, because if you think about it, in Europe, there's an A1. Hey, Brent Snavely's here. So you, you're keeping the tradition of us having other people come on the show who take their own leisurely time showing up. <laughs> well, so, sorry about the delay. Good to have you here, though. Heavier traffic than expected. Yeah. I apologize for that. Yeah, don't worry about it. No, it's good to have you here. It's all that ice from the Polar Vortex Mark 8 or whatever it is. <laughs> there we go. Sure. Gary's just filling me in. He was driving uh, the A3 sedan from Audi hmm. this week, earlier this week, right? Or was that last week? That was this week, yeah. Okay. Last week was uh, the big GM SUVs. That was right? a week before that. The week before that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I like those. I, I like those. I, there's a lot to like in those cars, but. Um, have you been in those, Brent? Uh, I have not. Yeah. I have uh, not. What, what I think is significant about the big GM SUVs is these are the first full size SUVs I'm aware of to get this magnetic rheological shock technology. Mm-hmm. And at least with the 20 inch wheels, <laughs> it's magic. Once you go up to the 22s, which I drove in a Yukon XL Denali, uh, the ride was not quite as good. And the GM guys did say, yeah, they're still tweaking the calibration mm-hmm. of it. But on the 20 inch uh, wheels on the Suburban that I drove, it, the ride is surprisingly good for such a big body on frame mm-hmm. SUV. But again, truth be told, the roads we were driving on were not exactly well, they're not Michigan. We're not exactly <laughs> like our roads by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, and yeah. so right. so you could have basically right. been driving a go-kart and you thought, man, this is really nice suspension setup. Yeah. I mean uh, but but those I mean those uh, again that 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 is is using that that uh, architecture that was developed that's being used for the new pickup trucks, the new full-size pickup trucks that, that GM has. The, so it goes back to the 2011 um, um, redevelopment of those pickups. And, uh, you know, but it's all new sheet metal. Um, I, it, it's, and it works it. Yeah. Unlike the Silverado, which is, to my eye at least, very difficult to discern from the prior model, the new Suburban, Tahoe, uh, Yukon, boy, you know them instantly. Right. They, and it's not like they're radically different. But mm-hmm. You know instantly that's the new one. Yeah, and uh, the, the Denali is is really a nice vehicle. I mean, it uh, is. Um, and what was interesting is is that um, so there's a 6.2 liter engine only in the Denali. Only in the Denali, and and I was like, when I was looking at my notes, I'm like. There's got to be something wrong here. You know, the, the, the Chevy has to have one. It's, it's there's there's something wrong here. And so I contacted them. They said, no, no, no. It's just just yeah. a Denali. Yeah. And uh, that's how you charge. What you can probably price a Denali up close to eighty thousand bucks now. Um, so you're you're, you're yeah. definitely into Range Rover tech well, territory. Um, yeah, we were in a Chevy that was at seventy two. So so the GMC's so it'd be very be it'd be very easy to walk up right. to to that that mm-hmm. price point. And, you know. and again, if you're going to charge that kind of money, you got to be able to tell them there's something unique about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, so uh, you're the only ones with a giant V eight in it. But but I think I think the exterior design of that car. I mean that that uh, you know the three dimensionality of of the grill the on grill that thing. And, and I mean they yeah, just the, and, and you know it's just one of those things where you look around right. and you just find these little. It looks fabricated, not molded. Right, right. It's did a good job on that. And, uh, but speaking of GM, I know, Brent, I'm sure you've been all over uh, covering this ignition switch fiasco that's blown up in their face. What do you make of that? What, what do you make of uh, how they're handling it? it? It seems to be, I mean, dribbling out, frankly. I mean, um, I was thinking a few weeks ago when they first expanded it to, to doubling the size of it, they really didn't provide a lot of info to consumers and you know, there was no, my editors wanted to know what phone number can we put in the story for readers to call while well, GM didn't provide a phone number that day, you know, and, and um, you know, now they're doing everything up to offering this $500, um, you know, re- rebate or, and, and loaner cars and, you know, so it seems like at first it was slow and then now they're just kind of catching up. It, it's, it's a little. What do you make, Gary? How, how do crazy. you think they're handling it? Well, I mean, 
It, it's, it's a little surprising, I mean, that, you know, and, and as he uses the word, you know, it's this like dribbling out and it isn't all, all you know, being revealed. And when I was reading the information about the $500, so it's to lease or buy a new car. And now, are they suggesting that dealers provide a loaner car or are they telling dealers that they provide a loaner car? And then I read something that it takes like five minutes to fix. And I mean, right. it's, w I'm, why would you have a loaner car if you could just get it, you know? I think it's, I think it's there for customers that want Want it. I don't think they're pushing it, um, but it's there if customers are uncomfortable. And the, the, here's the issue. The, the dealers don't have the parts yet. The, the, the ignition switches aren't getting to dealers until early April. So the loaner car is there for those that are scared to death to drive it between now and the time that the dealers get the ignition switches. And I think that's another question, too, is I, I don't... I don't um, think that you know every dealer in the country is going to have adequate supply of ignition switches on April 1st. It's going to take a little while. Dribble out like yes. the news. <laughs> and, there, and there's another end. And, you know, I, I don't know who I now. We now know who uh, made the initial ignition switches. I'm wondering who's making the replacement ignition switches, and what factory is churning out you know uh, a couple hundred thousand but replacement isn't it switches. Just the spring within the ignition switch. Yeah. Uh, 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 my and I don't profess to know you know all this in detail, but my understanding is they have too soft of a detent spring, so this thing can yes. be knocked in you know knocked off, mm -hmm. not in the running position, and that the real fix within the ignition switch is just a a tougher spring. Yeah, that I'm not sure about. That yeah. I'm not sure about. What, but, whatever the fix may be, yeah. And yeah. my understanding is it's it uh, it's not that expensive to do. It's uh, like a fifty dollar per job, you know, at the dealership, fifty dollars per job. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so, not so that do you big think do you think there are going to be a whole lot of people who uh, have these vehicles that are going to take advantage of this five hundred dollar? Uh, I I don't know. Um, what, what do you I, think of it? What I, mean, what, I, what I, I do know is my my phone is ringing off the hook with. With people that want information, that want to know no who to call to get more info, is their car covered? Um, all kinds of questions. Uh, I mean, it, I mean, the same thing happened last year with, and here's where I kind of urge some caution. I mean, I was going through this last year with the Jeep Cherokee recall with the you know exploding exploding rear gas tanks and the you know and the trailer hook fix that that Chrysler came up with. And we were writing the similar kinds of stories of will this damage their reputation? Um, will this? You but know, isn't this it, new it, but, recall but, but a year totally later, different, no. you know, nature. I mean, the, the rear gas tank thing in the Jeep. Yeah, it was it was a fluke accident kind of occurrence that it might happen. Right. And uh, a bumper hitch is kind of a. <laughs> I can't believe they got away with that. I know. But you know, it sort of does mitigate the problem. Whereas, uh, I'm astonished to learn because I. I haven't heard of this ignition switch problem. I've driven all the vehicles involved in it. I never had this incident happen to me at all. So, I, I mean, and yet, it's not at all uncommon. There's a dozen or more deaths attributed to it. Mm -hmm. and, and so, to me, even though you were writing the same kind of stories a year ago, this is a different story. Yeah. Well, um, it's, it's interesting. One of, one of our... Uh... Uh, people in the chat room, uh, JNM1NB wants to know what's worse, the ignition issue or how long, how it took a decade for them to admit it. Right. Well, that's right. the problem. Right. You know, defects happen. Car companies do the best job they possibly can, but, you know, every now and then something slips through. Mm -hmm. But that's the damage is why did they know about it a year ago why was a, a design change done but not approved mm -hmm. why did a design change happen and now they say they don't know how it happened what, what's go what, and, and do the, i have that right yeah i mean and the letter the letter that uh gm sent to to nitsa that we that we got yesterday is really kind of weird and revealing i mean it says they knew about this in 2005 and and issued an advisory to dealers, you know, to uh, uh, why they didn't take more action at the time is beyond me. I don't, I don't know. Well, it's interesting, you know, you're talking about you, you didn't have the experience. Um, one of our colleagues, Jeff Sabatini, who works at Car and Driver. Did have it. Did, he was, so he was, he was reviewing for the New York Times at the time, back in 2005, mm. and was a cobalt, and his wife had the car, and she experienced the problem. Right. And... Um, you know, he sent me a link to his story, and so there's the review, and then there's a box, 
Wow. And, and it's it's right there, you know, in, in the story. Well, you know, and this and is 2005. Yeah, and oh. that, look, that's what everybody is saying now. How could GM management not know about it when there was a New York Times story about it? Right. And there was a, a public relations response to that. Mm -hmm. So it, it's... I wonder if the, the letter that I read, um, the, the GM letter to NHTSA, referenced so, uh, uh, three stories, a New York Times story, a Cleveland Plain Dealer story, right. and a, a smaller local Ohio, like Sandusky, Ohio story or something like that. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if, I mean, they didn't cite the headline or the date of these stories. They just referenced the papers so, so from let's 2005. Do so I'm wondering if it was that story. Could have been. Could have been. Let, let's do a quick poll with the chat room. So everybody who's watching live right now, we want to know, we want you to rate GM's management in its handling of this crisis. And remember, the people who are running the show right now are not the people who made this decision, or so we don't think. We don't know that for a fact yet, do we? But we'll find out. Uh, so the poll for the chat room, uh, rate it on a one to five scale, with one being the worst, five being the best, how would you rate GM's management? And we'll get the results of that All right, in and, a little while. And on this topic, uh, Schmetzel wants to know, why didn't NHTSA let GM get away with this? Did GM, didn't NHTSA let them get away with it? You could argue that, and lawyers are arguing that. When did the fatalities start to happen in this? I mean, there's a dozen or so fatalities. Do we know when the first one occurred? Uh, I, think, I think there's one from 2008, um, and then there's one from 2010. I mean, some are after... He, with yeah. the first and definitely the second, that's when all the alarm bells should have been running yeah. and saying, you know, this is no longer just a debate over spring rates or whatever within an ignition lock. we got to act now. I mean, that, that's where, to me, something broke down mm. real bad that they didn't act at that point. But, but is, you know, is, is GM management sufficiently... In the forefront on this, I mean, do you do you get this? I mean, you're you're talking to them all the time. I mean, do you get the sense that they're they're proactively trying to solve this? I mean, I think back to the days when there was Saturn and there'd be any little problem, and you know, the, the guys at Saturn would be you know falling on their swords and cooking hot dogs. You know, I mean, just <laughs> whatever it took to keep the, the customers happy. And yeah. and I mean, I, from from the reporting that I'm reading about this, I mean, I'm not getting that sense that uh, that there's a whole lot of uh, activity that's that's. Proactive. I mean, they're trying to say that they are. Uh, um, they, you know, Mary Barra issued a letter to, um, you know, to employees that GM posted on one of its sites, you know, saying saying they're doing this is the new GM. They're being proactive. They've got a, basically an internal. They hired an outside law firm to do an investigate their own investigation. Um, I don't know. So it, <laughs> they're on it. They're taking steps, but is it enough? And and, and we'll, we'll we'll see. And I, you know, April 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 third is going to be a really interesting day. That's when um, you know GM's response to NHTSA with like 103 questions or something like 107. that. 107. 107 is is due to be turned in. We'll all be. We'll all be uh, trying to get a hold of that and sort through those answers. That'll be a fun day. Yeah, I was, I was very surprised, I mean, to go to the NHTSA website and see all 107 <laughs> questions were there. I mean, you could, you could read them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, I mean, some of them very engineering related, and, but many of them very much related to, you know, the classic, you know, when did you know and or, when did you know it yeah, or what did, what did you know? What did you know and when did you know it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Going back to Watergate, yeah, some people are already calling this Switchgate. <laughs> you know, where it is. This Everything has to have a name. But here's the other, uh, I, I think, critical question as far as their public image goes. Do they just go, hey, that was liquidation motors, baby. That's the old GM. We don't owe nobody a dime. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that would be, even if it would be totally legal for them to do, it would be disaster. And of course, they'd yeah. pretty it up in the way they said it, not like I just did. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I can't believe just from a public relations standpoint that they cannot, the new GM has got to accept total blame for this and liability. Yeah. That's how I... They will take a public relations pounding if they do that. But you can just see the lawyers, I mean, I can just hear the legal arguments going, wait, whoa, I mean... This, if we open this, what the, you don't know what's down the road. What other I mean, you you then set a precedent mm -hmm. that just erases the entire mm -hmm. that, that entire um, liability agreement from two thousand nine.
It does, but I, I think a good precedent is what Toyota went through with the, the whole so-called unintended yeah. acceleration. Uh, you know, I don't know what the final bill on that was. Well, it must be a big bill, but I mean, I think there's a difference here is that, is that basically Toyota was saying that that was not a problem. I mean, this was not... No, it was the, it was the it same was, issue. They were not reacting to it. They but, were, you know, brushing it under the rug. You know, this will go away. Right. But, you know, but when, you know, when the smoke cleared and then they brought in all the scientists and the guys from NASA and said, okay, you know, find the ghost in the machine and nobody could find it. And they're just basically saying, look, this is not a problem versus the case with... Not a technical problem. Right. But what uh, was clearly well, identified because they brought in other experts to not examine the you know, the, the physical properties of the car and what gremlins might be in there right. causing the car. To, they looked at the structure of Toyota and how it reacted to this or did oh, not yeah, react yeah, yeah. to it. And the company initiated really pretty significant changes as mm -hmm. a result of that. Right. And I wonder uh, if that's not a precedent for what GM's about to go through. It's going to, this is going to drag on for a couple of years. It's going to cost maybe now a couple of billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. I've been saying hundreds of millions. Maybe it's even going to be greater than that by the time it's over. See, but does, does this take the, you know, the, the bloom off the rose in terms of the new products that General Motors is, you know, the, I hope the, not. the aforementioned, you know, full-size SUVs. Right. I yeah. mean, do, you know, do, do people look at that and say, eh, But Gary, I already, I got an email from a viewer this week who said, you know, I was going to go out and shop for a Buick Regal. He says, I'm not going to any GM product right now. Now, you got to take what people tell you online with a grain of salt, and this is only one person, but ah, we'll see what happens. I think know. it does raise that issue. It raises the issue of, it, it, it brings back all of those old memories and stereotypes of old GM that they have worked hard to get beyond. Right. It, it, cl it clearly does. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and as I look at what our chat room is saying, that people are, are going back and forth, it's either that, you know, this is, this is uh, you know, pre-bankruptcy beating on GM still, you mm -hmm. know, that people are still on their case to others saying, you know, um, it's like the old GM and others are saying, well, um, Toyota's a media darling, GM is not, and this is, you know, but I, I think when you have the president of General Motors North America saying, you know, Ellen Beatty, like, yeah, it's, we did it. We're sorry. You know, we're going to look into it. But, uh, but you know, to the point of communications, to get off this topic a little bit, the uh, Simon Sproul moving oh. from uh, this <laughs> nice is sort segue of segue there, Gary. I mean, but this is okay. But admittedly, this is inside baseball for yeah. us guys. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and in terms anybody of this, anybody in the media, anybody in corporate communication. But it, but it, but it is. But it's big news. It's big news. So Tesla went out and hired uh, away from Nissan Renault a guy named Simon Sproul. Great friend of ours, you know, anybody who, who's known him. Uh, great car guy, really knows the business, uh, has worked at Ford, at Jaguar. I think he, I, when I first met him, I think he had just got out of BMW. He's been reporting directly to Carlos Ghosn uh, for both Nissan and Renault. And Tesla hires him. Yeah. Holy moly. Right. And I got to believe they just started laying down bills and said, oh, and here's your stock options, too, by the way, mm -hmm. because I'll bet Simon done real good moving over to mm -hmm. Tesla. You know, the sort of the surprising thing that I was thinking about, and this is this just gets back to the whole thing of image versus perhaps substance. But um, in all the years I've known Simon, I've never seen him wearing anything but a tailored three piece suit. <laughs> and I have He's never seen proper British okay, gentleman. But but I've never seen an image of Elon Musk where he wasn't wearing a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so this is, this. <laughs> I like yeah. where this is going. I mean, Gary. Just... <laughs> well, and, and, and yeah, there's all kinds of things that are like contradictory to me with Tesla. I mean, on one hand you've got, and maybe this is an outcome of it. To me, this is Tesla saying, okay, we're serious about you know, communicating professionally now, and, and maybe they always were, but this is a move that, that is, you know, they're going out and getting among the best in the industry, among the most experienced. They're serious about, about doing what they're doing. And yet, we just saw them at the Detroit Auto Show with one of the weirdest, worst <laughs> performances of a press conference that I've ever seen at the D D Detroit Auto Show, you know. 
um, you know, th just standing up. The, the, the executive was up there t talking off the cuff without, uh, uh, you know, stammering through. Hard to hear. Uh, I recorded it and went back to listen to and get a quote off of my recorder. I couldn't even hear clearly what the guy was saying. I didn't get it. It was hard to get a good quote out of it. So y you've got this on one hand, Tesla being really serious about things and wanting to do things right, and yet they do things vastly differently than any other car company out there. Which, which gets back to the thing, I, I, I've, I've often thought that they're not a car company in the classic sense that we think of car companies. Yeah. I think they're a technology company that happens to be making cars. <laughs> and you know, over the years, I found that it is, it is profoundly different to deal with the you know, companies that make computers or software in, in trying to you know get to their executives and and it, than it is in the auto industry. I mean, it's, it's surprising how good we have it compared to some of our colleagues that are that are tech reporters sure. and just Absolutely. that are yeah. dealing with that. And so you know the fact that Tesla is doing it in sort of a you know previously a bizarro world way, I think that may speak to the nature of that company. I mean, you know, the guy's doing SpaceX and he's got that Solar City project where he's putting uh, solar sails into Best Buy stores and he's got to deal with Home Depot and, you know, they're doing that. And um, I, I think that maybe, you know, after when they were talking about, you know, the Gigafactory and where they're going to put the, you know, the giant battery manufacturing operation and, you know, what state out in the... Uh, the Southwest, and you know he's got that going. He's got yeah, the, only the ones that'll let him sell cars, right. not through dealer franchises. And, That's where he's going to put that gigafactory. Well, he's 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 obviously a very clever man in terms of saying, hey, you know, would you like our factory? Yeah. Well, you better you know make sure that we get yeah. around those it's dealer only franchise $6 billion laws. Dollars, by the way, but. Yeah. Um, so you know, I, I think that's a, a, a big difference. But now with Simon Sproul coming in who is, you know, the classically trained automotive PR guy mm -hmm. um, and has had, you know, more than a small amount of experience because let's not forget the, the, uh, the Nissan Leaf and the various Renault variants that uh, are out there that, that Simon has been dealing with uh, for, good point. for Very the, good point. you know, period of time it's been out there. So I think that he's probably had more objections raised to him than we could even think of, you know, um, in the next hour. And you know he'll he'll definitely be able to handle these things. Well, you know Joe Filippi, the uh, uh, analyst guy, really good. I, I I thought he had the best uh, insight into this. He said, "Look, they went out and hired Simon. Why? Because he works for this boss that runs all around the world, runs two separate companies, and is crazy about electric cars. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not that much different for him to go work for Elon, right?" Right. Actually, he won't be working for Elon as much as who's running Tesla, really, operations wise. I think Elon is. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, that guy probably never sleeps. You know, I mean, he's I mean, literally probably never sleeps. And uh, yeah, he's he's running on pure adrenaline. Um, Lithium power. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's why they're building that big factory. That's right. Hey, uh. Why don't we take a, a break right now, and we got to talk about this smashed-up Acura MDX that we got in the studio here. So, Ben, why don't we give a, a good shout-out to our, our friends at Bridgestone and Firestone. There's only one car company in America that's never made a single car. And while you won't find Firestone cars on any showroom floor, they're out there running better, faster, stronger, longer. No, we don't build cars. But make no mistake, Firestone is a car company. So whatever you drive, drive a Firestone. AutoLine offers you one of the most effective ways to get your marketing message in front of the decision makers in the global automotive industry. Contact Stacy Eman today. Gary's got some results from the poll from the chat room as to how GM management is handling this crisis. With All right, the so, so, so the Insta poll results, how did GM handle the recall with one being worst and five being best? 35% said one worst. 
three percent said five best, and then we have two is twenty seven, three twenty six, four nine. So if we take the the insta poll, the, so the bad take, is. So if you take the, the four and the five and you add that together, you come up with a whopping twelve. And if you take the one and the two and you add them together, you come up with uh, sixty two. So sixty two percent of our <laughs> basically are, are not very happy. Are not, not happy so with the way GM management is handling. Yeah. It. And you got a good line there, you said? Yeah, there there was a uh, uh, Scott in Cleveland wrote, uh, I just counted eighteen keys on my keychain. Mazda ignition cylinders must be very sturdy. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. So anyway, we now have to turn to our guest in the studio, Chuck Thomas, the Chief Engineer for, you say it for me. Uh, for Automotive Structure Research. Yeah. yeah. And, and we've got this uh, crashed MDX in the studio, which I love. Now, this is one that you actually crash tested. It, it is. What we have in the studio is a, uh, a vehicle that we actually tested in our lab down in uh, Raymond, Ohio. And then we, uh, we took the vehicle and we disassembled it down to uh, basically just what we call a white body and left some of the chassis and the powertrain. So you could really get a better sense of what happened to the car in the crash. Yeah, and, and that's pretty wild, what you just said, because, you know, we see all kinds of car cutaways at automotive shows around the world and the like. And But you've created this one by taking a complete vehicle, smashing it up, and then taking all—you took out all the seats, you took off the doors, you took off a whole bunch of stuff just so we could see how the structure crushed here. Exactly. Like, I mean, usually in, after a crash, you know, because of all the exterior components, the doors, the trim, the hood, the, fi the fender fascias and those types of things, it's hard to really see what the structure did, the parts of the car that really, uh, you know, aren't the Class A or the, the Class 1 surfaces. So by stripping the car down to its body, you can really get a sense of sort of how the bones of the car performed in the crash. And, and those are the parts of the car that are, you know, really are the, the basic protection that you have. And in a car crash, um, you know, uh, I maybe I have a little bit of a prejudice because I'm a structural engineer, but really the car body is the kind of foundation that's protecting you in the crash. Um, you know, things like airbags and, and seatbelts are critically important to protect you as well. Um, but for those things to work, the structure has to protect and maintain the space around you during the crash. And the crash specifically that this vehicle underwent was this new Insurance Institute for Highway Safety small offset crash. That's right. So uh, just recently, the Insurance Institute has introduced this new crash mode. Uh, this is a 25% uh, overlap crash with a uh, rigid steel barrier. Uh, so explain what you mean by a 25% overlap. So if you think about, if you look at, say, the, fr the front of your car, and you think of the width of your car, uh, say, from fender to fender, that would be 100% of your width. So from, say, the driver's side of the vehicle, if you would measure over 25% of that width, that's the area of the vehicle that actually is targeted to overlap with the barrier that you're going to impact against. Or, or to put it simply, in the, in the case of this vehicle, the left front corner. That's right. And with a 25% overlap, for most vehicles, that, uh, in, it will not engage what we think of as the main crash structure. So in the front of the vehicle, there, there are two large rails that uh, are on each side of the engine. And one of the main functions of these rails is to absorb energy during a crash. But in this type of crash, these rails aren't really engaged. So other parts of the structure have to sort of step up and do what that rail would normally do in a front crash. How much of, how much of this is predicated on types of material versus the architecture of how you put these various pieces together? Well, it, it's interesting you ask that because the two are, are really intimately connected. Um, today, I've been in the automotive industry for about 22 years, and today we have materials and steels that are available to us that we just couldn't even really think about using, you know, 20 years ago. So what we're able to do when we design the architecture of the car, literally the architecture, so the shape and the design of each component is created with the type of material in mind that we're going to make it out of. So we're able to put high strength materials where we need high strength materials. And because of those strengths, that changes how we make the shape of the part. Um, in areas where we want more ductility or we want more energy absorption, we actually design those structures using more ductile materials. So, uh, you know, you'll see more bending and more deformation in those areas. So really, the two are sort of connected together. It's, um, it, it's, I, it's, it's hard to separate the two because uh, literally the type of material that you use determines the type of shape part you can make. Um, some very high tensile strength steels uh, can't easily be formed. So those are the types of materials that might be used, say, for a, a bent part or a roll-formed part. 
where uh, some of the more advanced high string steels that are hot formed can have d much deeper draws than you could even have with traditionally cold stamp steel. Hmm. So. Um, we're in an era where um, automakers are trying to take weight out of cars in order to improve fuel efficiency. How much weight does it add to design a car to withstand this test, and what about cost? Yeah. Well, it, it's interesting you mentioned that the MDX, this white body for the 2014 MDX, is actually 125 pounds lighter than the previous MDX white body. So I, I think you know, there is this perception that you know, safety has a, a weight penalty. But it will have a cost penalty because well, when you start talking about boron impregnated hot stamp hot strength uh, steel, it, it, it's not the cold rolled stuff. That's true. There are costs associated with materials, but a lot of the materials actually the cost of the material is, is not much of an increase, believe it or not, because, because you can use less of it. You can use less of it, and really, what for many of these steels, uh, the the processing and the forming is not as different as you would think. So, um, you know, going from, say, a, a tensile strength steel in the kind of the old days, it maybe had, say, 250 or 300 megapascals, up to steels that are still cold formed, up to almost 900 megapascals, the cost difference is not so high. Um, there is some cost associated with the investment because the tools that are necessary to form these types of parts, um, you know, have to be stronger. They're more difficult to manufacture. But really, when you amortize that cost into the vehicle, um, it really actually turns out to be relatively small. And then one's got to believe that in terms of the consumer that if it passes the IIHS requirements that your insurance rate would be somewhat lower. So if, even if you had to pay a premium to get the safer car, you might... Is that true? Be... Okay. Will, will this MDX or does this MDX have a lower insurance premium? I, you know, I, I'm really not sure how it's going to work out. I mean, um, it, how the insurance in industry really comes up with those uh, those premiums, it's hard for me to answer. But what I am pretty confident with this MDX is what we're going to see is over the life of this vehicle, um, you know, it, it's going to perform better than any vehicle we've ever made. So from a point of view of the crash outcomes of this vehicle, uh, we expect it to really be outstanding. Chuck, did you come up with clever ideas and not just material <laughs> substitution to get this lighter weight body and white? Yeah, you know, there's a really interesting history when you think about what we've done to design this car. Um, you know, Honda's been interested in um, kind of non-traditional crashes for a long time. Uh, we, we've been doing research for several years into uh, the problems of compatibility in the fleet. Uh, I heard you guys talking a little earlier about some of the, the large, like, full-size SUV products. And, you know, when those vehicles st first started showing up in the fleet, you know, Honda began studying the types of crashes that occur between large vehicles and small vehicles because you know, our vehicles have a tendency to be a little bit smaller. And we were concerned about how these compatibility outcomes could affect, uh, you know, our vehicles. So we began doing research into how to make smaller vehicles more compatible with larger vehicles and at the same time how to make larger vehicles designed such that they interact in a more favorable, favorable way with small vehicles. And from that, we came up with this idea we call ACE, which is uh, Advanced Compatibility Engineered Bodies. And when we introduced that in 2005, that was our first kind of step along this idea of these types of crashes. Um, and then when we, when we saw, uh, we were developing the 2014 MDX early in its uh, platform development, and we saw some of the work the Insurance Institute was doing, uh, looking at these types of small overlap crashes that were occurring in the field. And one thing that's nice about the Insurance Institute, they have access to a lot of data that we don't have because they have the insurance industry's data. Um, so they were identifying these types of crashes, and we were kind of interested because there was a lot of overlap between what we were doing for the new MDX and what they had found. And so by studying their results, we were able to sort of adapt the structures that we already had. Um, so, you know, things like uh, large upper members and extended outboard structures in the front of the vehicle um, were really the same kind of solution that we were looking at that they were looking at. See, and kudos to you guys because you're way ahead of the rest of the industry on this one. Uh, I would say maybe Subaru and Volvo are sort of in being able to meet yeah. these small offset crashes, but I'm so impressed that Honda is so far ahead of everybody else. And I almost thought you guys were in collusion with the Insurance Institute, that you were so far ahead of everyone. Uh, no, no collusion, but, um, you know, the Insurance Institute is a, a, an organization that publishes a lot of their research. Uh, you know, when we first really heard them speak publicly about this was back in 2009 in Germany at the uh, ESV conference there. And they had published several papers uh, looking at this small overlap phenomena. Um, and that's when we first realized that, you know, there's, there's a lot of, you know, um, overlap between what we were looking at and what they were looking at. And uh, I, I've made a lot of trips down. Overlap of the overlap. Overlap of the overlap. <laughs> Um, because, you know, we're really all looking at the same problem. Um, you know, even today in the fleet, with all the improvements we've made in automotive safety, 
um, you know, we're still looking at around 32,000 traffic fatalities each year in the United States. So, you know, every automaker and, and groups like the insurance center are constantly looking for, you know, where are the areas we can continue to improve in the performance of the vehicle. You know, it's interesting, you know, you're saying that they're so far ahead, and as he mentioned, I think this is this is really important to point out that you guys have been doing this for a long time. I went and looked back to see, you know, when Honda started talking about the ACE body structure. And uh, so this goes back um, to the beginning of 2005, and... Uh, so they're, they're basically saying, um, blah, 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 the ACE body structure offering enhanced occupant protection while at the same time increasing compatibility with other vehicles will be applied to all new vehicle platforms in the U.S. and globally over the next, next six to seven years. The 2005 model Honda Odyssey minivan and Acura RL sedan are the first models to carry this technology. So, I mean, these guys have been, been working it for a very long time. It's, it's, it's right. not like they thought, hmm, yeah. this would be a good idea to maybe do now. So, I, well, like I said, I, I, I've also, as, as gushing I have been in what I just said about Honda, you know, have been astounded to see everybody else caught with their pants down. Th this is the only area where I fault the Insurance Institute is. Uh, I think it's a totally legitimate test. But to start testing knowing that no one ever designed for this, or, or so many never designed for it, I think is unfair. I think you should give plenty of warning. You should give at least one design cycle warning saying this is what's coming. Because I think they could have uh, affected faster change doing it that way throughout the industry. How long do you think it will take the industry to catch up and adapt to, to the test? and have cars on the road that, that meets it? Well, I, I think that uh, for most vehicles, to, to make the kind of changes we made to the MDX really requires a full model change redesign cycle. Um, we have made changes to vehicles mid-cycle. The, uh, the 2014 Honda Odyssey, we did a mid-cycle redesign on to improve its performance in this type of crash. And um, you can do it. The, the biggest problem you're going to run into is in that mid-cycle redesign, um, there is a weight penalty. Mm. Because without being able to sort of like, you know, rebuild the entire architecture of the vehicle to be more efficient, the only way you can really do that is by adding additional components and additional structure. So, you know, it's probably going to take, I would imagine, for the, for the whole fleet, at least like several years before everything can sort of be redesigned. Yeah. Um, so, so the mid-cycle will be like belt and suspenders, but if you design it <laughs> from the beginning, it's one or the other? That's maybe a good way to put it, yeah. So. so Chip's over there with the camera. What I'd like to do is point out for the audience here some of the specifics of what you had to change in this front-end design to be able to meet this small offset. So I don't know if uh, you can see the, the screen there well enough, but, but Ben will bring it up. But uh, So for everybody watching right now, let, let's just look at what's on the screen, the left-hand side of the vehicle, and you see this, this big orange thing coming out of uh, the base of uh, the A-pillar and the cowl of the vehicle running down all the way to the bumper beam. That's right. So, uh, and I've never seen anything like that on a car before. Right. It, it's, it's a little novel. Um, it's actually something that came out of the original ACE work that we did. And uh, this, this is the part we call the upper member. Um, traditionally, this part is very small because it would really only support the fender. Um, but what we did is we extended it all the way down to the bumper beam to do two things effectively. Um, one is it helps support the bumper beam because our bumper beam is extended in this type of design. And let's, let's go back to that shot of... Uh, the bumper beam, of course, if you're looking at the screen, is at the very bottom of the screen. It just looks like a big uh, extrusion or stamping. The, that's the uncrunched one that we can see there on yeah. the side. Yeah. And so usually the, the, the front members are what's commonly called the shotguns. The, the bumper beam is only as wide as they are. And when you're saying extended, this bumper beam goes out beyond the shotgun. Right. So um, what we wanted to do is in this type of crash, we want to be able to engage the, the vehicle that you're going to impact against or, or the structure you're going to impact against or whatever you might hit in these type of small overlap phenomena. So the first thing we need is we need structure in the forward corner of the car that's there to begin the engagement early in the event. Because literally in a crash, every millisecond counts for a lot. So the earlier we can engage whatever you're impacting, the more time we have to absorb crash energy before the, the, what we call the crash interface reaches the cabin where the occupant is. So by using the bumper beam and some other structures in the lower bulkhead and even structures in the subframe uh, that, that help support the chassis, we can develop a, a early engagement in your, in your crash partner's um, situation. That quickly allows us to begin to load up the structure and begin to absorb that energy early on. So what you're really doing is just tying everything together, really? Right. You've got braces and 
you know, members going this way and that just yeah. to tie the whole structure together. Right. We want to have something that's outboard of the front side frame that's there to interact with in this type of crash. We just don't want empty air up there. We need a structure up there. But then we also need something to support that structure and something that can absorb energy during the crash as we move through the engine compartment. Because normally we would use the side frame, but in these types of crashes, the side frame is not very engaged. So one of the things you see, that large orange sort of trunk type shape is that upper member. And that structure actually absorbs a lot of the energy as it's crushed. And if you look at, say, the, um, the other side of the vehicle where it is crushed, you can see how deformed it is. Uh, after the crash. Yeah, yeah, and, and we've got that shot up on the screen right now. I mean, it, it's just smashed. <laughs> but, but so you're taking the energy and, I mean, the energy doesn't go away. I mean, you, right. you hit something, the, there's some law of thermodynamics, I'm sure, that <laughs> says it isn't going away. So what you want to do is, is direct it into areas that will keep the people who are within the vehicle safe. So it's not, it's yeah. not like you just have a, a big stiff thing that you're ramming against a Exactly. I mean, like we talked about earlier, you know, part of the idea with material selection is what do we want that particular part to do during a crash? And components in the engine compartment, forward of the occupant space, we want those parts to actually deform during the crash because that deformation at, absorbs that crash energy. So the, the work that's done by deforming those parts mm -hmm. takes energy, and that energy is taken out of the crash situation. Right. So by absorbing that energy, it reduces the velocity of the car and reduces the energy that we have to manage when the crash event sort of reaches the occupant space. Mm -hmm. you know? And then once we kind of move through the engine compartment, what's left is you know, the occupant space. So eventually the crash interface reaches where the occupant is. Mm -hmm. And what we want to have happen in this type of crash is we want to maintain the integrity of that occupant space. Because there's a lot of energy left. This crash is, is very severe. It's uh, run at 40 miles an hour. So there's a lot of kinetic energy, especially for a large vehicle like the MDX. So when that crash interface reaches the cabin, we need to have the cabin be strong enough to withstand whatever force is left without deforming. So what we've done with the MDX is where we use the highest strength steels, these, like really hot, these really high strength hot stamp parts. And particularly the MDX has a ring, one piece of steel ring that forms the, the ring around the driver's door. And that structure provides a tremendous amount of strength. So when the crash interface and the chassis and everything else that's been driven back into the cabin reaches that, that area actually doesn't deform. And what that does is it produces a high force against the vehicle cabin. And that high force makes the cabin begin to rotate. So um, I didn't really bring any videos with me, but your audience can find plenty of them on YouTube on the, uh, the channel the Insurance Institute runs there. And you can see these kind of crashes. And what will happen is these uh, vehicles like the MDX, when the crash interface reaches the cabin, you'll see the vehicle beneath yaw, yaw very quickly. And that yawing is important because what that's doing is it's carrying that remaining energy away as kinetic energy, and it's dissipating that energy as the vehicle turns. Um, because we want, to, we want to remove that energy from the equation. We don't want you to have to experience that energy in the crash. And as you mentioned before the show began, um, one of the things that people may notice that there is a rear tire, but there's no front tire, that the, the wheel explodes due to the impact, and that despite all of that damage that we can see there, that the door actually opened on that. Yeah, this door, uh, yeah, you're right. So in the, during the crash, the, the chassis is literally crushed. The wheel is crushed into pieces. In the MDX, actually, the brake rotor itself is broken into pieces. It's just compressed against the white body. Um, however, that ring actually re reacts all that force and protects that occupant space. And, and after this test, uh, not only did the door open, which makes it pretty easy to get the crash tell me out of the test, uh, the door closes again. Um, so I, I, the, maybe the, the gap tolerances may have been tweaked a little bit. So I don't know if it would have meet the quality assurance. So it wouldn't go through a car wash without <laughs> yeah. getting water inside. Yeah. You know, no. I mean, it's yeah. just to open and close. Yeah. That's yeah. pretty yeah. impressive. It it's because, you know, I mean, that's important. Maintaining that occupant space is, is really critical to help trying to protect the occupant. Because what we're trying to do is not only are we trying to prevent them from, you know, intrusion injuries, where the, the structure sort of collapses around you and injures you, but also is these other key protective devices like the airbags and the seatbelts are connected to the body. So if the body collapses or the body deforms around you, these devices move and they're not really intended to move. So if the, if the airbag moves towards you or towards the center of the car, it reduces the effectiveness of that airbag. Hmm. If the, you know, if the um, area of the door is, is heavily deformed, the door can actually open or come off. Um, and of course that poses a real serious risk to an occupant. Hey, this is uh, probably a, a good time to get into all the questions that are coming in from uh, the audience. And so we're going to go back to calling this the rapid fire segment. And Ben, let's let that rip.
Okay, Chuck, uh, HTG, you, you touched on this a little bit, but he wants to know, how much do the wheel and tire contribute to absorbing the energy of this offset crash? Uh, it, it, in this vehicle, I mean, uh, I couldn't tell you exactly how many joules. It depends a little bit on the type of wheel. So, for example, an aluminum wheel is going to break and it's going to crack. And that type of deformation actually absorbs less energy than you would with a steel wheel, where the steel actually bends and deforms. Um, but, I mean, it is a significant part of what we're trying to do in the crash. Amelia Fun says, what if you made a boat tail nose on the car so it would deflect <laughs> off of accidents? Well, you know, the, the problem with that is that might work if you, say, run this crash test. But in the real world, you know, the angles and the vectors that vehicles interact with aren't pre-described like you would have in a laboratory. So it's important we design the structure. We can't design the structure to function in just like one type of crash. We have to think about all the types of configurations you might run into in the real world. But wouldn't a bullet nose or a pointier nose uh, maybe accommodate a whole lot of accidents? Well, it uh, might. Pedestrian safety. <laughs> well, <laughs> but, yeah. but you could imagine. Not that pointy. You can imagine the situation where the vehicle that you strike may come in at sort of an angle to right. you. So it may actually hit normal to that boat shape. Mm -hmm. So then how strong that boat shape is, you know, really makes a difference. Yeah. Uh, he also wants to know, how hopeful are you that autonomous vehicles could greatly mitigate fatalities? We're really hopeful. Um, you know, it's, uh, I, I work in, in injury mitigation and structures, and uh, I often say I'm one of the few guys at Honda that really look forward to going out of business. Um, you know, we hope that in the future uh, that active safety technologies are going to have a big impact on, re on reducing crashes overall. And if you don't crash, then the stuff that I work on doesn't really have much of a function. But um, I think it's exciting because today we're really beginning to see the potentials of these types of accident avoidance technologies. Um, you know, we've started introducing them in some of our vehicles and, and so have many of our competitors, and we're really looking forward to see the effect that they're going to have over the next several years. BR says, now that front ends are going to be stiffer to pass the small offset, are we going to see a resurgence of injuries that were more common before the advent of crumple zones? I don't think so, because the, the thing is, the front end is not necessarily stiffer, because what we do is we balance the stiffness in the front end. So while we add structures, say, like in the, uh, the outer, outer areas, like that upper member, what we also do is we design the side frame not to be extra stiff. So we're, we're just kind of distributing the stiffness right, so over a larger area. the energies so it, it's not... Exactly, yeah. How much of this did you design by testing and smashing things against a wall, and how much did you design by just using computer... Analysis. Most of what we've done with this vehicle was actually designed uh, through computer modeling or computer engineering. Um, I, for years, I, I was a computer analyst and I did a lot of structural modeling. And those tools today are, are incredibly powerful. We really couldn't design vehicles like this without the computer modeling that we have available to us because you just can't go through that many iteration cycles. Uh, literally, you know, we can run hundreds of simulations uh, to look at different material combinations, different construction with a computer model that, you know, maybe if you do prototype testing, you know, you can only build a few vehicles to really evaluate. And much of what you see in these types of structures, especially with these types of materials, is sometimes very counterintuitive. So, you know, even as an experienced engineer, what you might think would, would work, you know, often doesn't really work as well as you would hope it would. Hmm. And, uh, and the computer is very objective. I mean, it just, you know, helps you understand what's really going on. JM1NB wants to know, what competitor car have you taken apart and learned something novel from? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, I actually don't get a chance to take very many cars apart because, uh, you know, uh, I, when I finish with them, they're not worth very much. So people don't like to, to give me the, you know, expensive cars like you guys get to drive. Um, you know, I think that, um, you know, uh, I mean, that is a really difficult question. Uh, I... I um, for, for, for what we've done in this situation, I, I can't really think of anybody that we really looked at carefully. Um, you know, I think in a lot of ways we were kind of pretty far ahead with what we already done with compatibility. Um, but uh, there are some interesting ideas out there. I mean, um, you know, many of the European companies, I think, have been uh, very um, active in the development of these high-strength materials. And, uh, you know, uh, I think that's definitely something that we looked at to see, you know, what was available from a strength of materials that we could try to integrate into our structures. But... Um, when it comes to the architecture, there's not very much architecture out of the MDX that's based on anything else. Is, is this applicable to sedans? So will, will this have an effect on a Civic? It will, and it, it already has. Um, the, the Accord meets this test. The, the Accord earned a good rating. The Civic actually earned a good rating. Um, and the technology that we have developed and integrated into the MDX has been reflected into those vehicles as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as quickly as we can, we're reflecting it into our entire fleet. we got a whole bunch of... Uh, 
questions or comments coming in about the, the GM ignition switch. <laughs> Alex Norwood says, I can't be the only person out here who thinks GM should not be responsible for any of these people's problems with 437 keys hanging off the keychain. Where does it stop? Where, what if I want to hang a bowling ball off mine? Put me in that jury pool. <laughs> P.S. Stop hating my Chevy Volt. <laughs> Doesn't that have a push button start? <laughs> no key ring. The Volt. Here's yeah. another uh, Schmedzel. I, I think you, you at, said something about him. He said he wants to know: Is it possible that the old boys network at GM put Mary Barra in place to struggle with a no-win situation? Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, there's that, lots of conspiracy theories. There, there, out there. There, there's some yeah. conspiracy <laughs> theories on that one. All right. It looks like we got a phone call on this one coming in too. Uh, ben, let's bring that in. Yeah, this is Cleb Zorowski from Delmont, Pennsylvania. I've been driving for over 60 years, and I've had a car a couple of times. Uh, engine quit running, driving down the road, and all I do is all you do is bump it into neutral and cross both to the side of the road. I just don't understand how these people get involved in accidents that people get killed when this happens. Uh, I enjoy your program very much, and I follow it all the time. Thank you. I, I understand the, you know, what he's saying is he's just saying, well, put the car in neutral and coast to the side of the road. And that's great if you're just going in a straight line. What if you're cornering, trying to cut in front of that truck, you know, where you think you have enough space and room, and boom, the thing conks out. What if you're on a turn? I, I, I understand what he's saying. It, in some situations, I think it's easy enough, but in others, it's not going to be that easy to deal with. Or, or in very heavy traffic, rush hour traffic. You can't just slow down. The guy in back of you might run into you. Yeah. And having 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 just driven in uh, in Georgia in in an ice storm, um, what, totally different kind of a situation. But uh, you know, I observed people that don't know how to. I mean, for better or worse, they have no idea how to drive in snow. And any time their car slid just a little bit, their brake lights lit up. I mean, they slammed on the brakes, which yeah, of course the is the worst thing to do. Worst thing to do. You had the you had to do an extra level of defensive driving to survive down there through that. <laughs> uh, VRM Chris Gary heard you talking about the A3 earlier, and he says, why buy the A3 when the A4 is similar in price when comparably equipped? Um, well, my, my point of view on that would be um, it's, it's, a, it's a different car. It's a smaller car. You'd be looking for something different. And... I think if you're looking at, at it in terms of size, I mean, the A4 is bigger than the A3. And the A3 is new. I mean, it's like, why not buy the new one? That's, that's what I would do, I mean, if I were buying a car. And, and finally, uh, Glenn Strauss says, you know, we, we've been reporting uh, Uwe Ellinghaus, the new CMO at Cadillac, has said maybe it's time to get away from this alphabet soup of the way that we name cars. Uh, so Glenn says, I, for one, think that Cadillac names are the way it should be. Just like the European car companies, you pretty much can tell the order of the hierarchy in the brand with what there is now. I would hate to see some of those old names come back. Isn't Cadillac trying to move away from the perception of car, its cars being for an older clientele? So I wrote a review this week of the ELR, and I had an email that came in and said, what does ELR stand for? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so my only response was, what does Escalade mean? <laughs> uh, right. I don't know. I, I, I think it'd be good to get. I, I don't think there is a, 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 there's ATS, CTS, okay, DTS. No, that's, that's XLR. SRX, SRX. S yeah. What, what's the big sedan? XLR. XTS. 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 See, it's too hard. It's mm -hmm. just... I, I, yeah, and I, let's not start talking about Lincoln or any of the others, because then they, they all get jumbled. Or Acura. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Chuck's not here to talk about that. Right. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I, we've run out of questions for rapid fire. Uh, it's probably as good a time to wrap it up here. Or do you have anything from uh, the, the chat room there? To um, you pretty much hit the, uh, the high points here. There, there was one that was I thought was... Uh, Amelia Fun wrote um, something about um, having a an accord in a 
crash at 55 miles an hour and only had to replace three pieces that they could wrench off and buy the parts on eBay. So wow. that was, uh, I think that was either That's pretty good. Um, let me confirm that. Yeah, Emil, you found I, I just had a 96 Accord wreck at 55 miles an hour, only had to wrench off three parts, total of $150 worth of eBay parts. So, wow. of course, his 55 mile an hour accident is nothing like a 40 mile an hour impact into an immovable object. Uh, that's true. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there'd the, be more than 150 mm -hmm. bucks worth of parts on that. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, I've always been told that uh, hitting an immovable object at whatever speed is like yeah. hitting another parked car at double that speed. That's about right. So yeah. a 40 mile an hour barrier impact is like smashing into another parked car at 80 miles an hour. Mm. Right. Yeah, it, it, car, if that car was your weight. Right? Because so a lot of people think yourself. 40, what's the big deal? 40's not that big a speed, but yeah. it, it, it'll send a chill down your spine to hear the, hear the impact. Yeah, we, um, in our laboratory uh, in Ohio, we often uh, do, uh, you know, have visitors and we'll run tests for them. And uh, it's, it's really interesting to see the different responses that people have that have never really been up and close to, to see an actual car crash. And the two things that happen, I always I hear from people, is the first thing is when the car comes into the lab at, say, you know, 40 or 35 miles an hour, um, it seems like it's not going very fast. Uh, and then, you know, about 75 feet from the entrance to the lab to the barrier, it hits the barrier, and then people are just shocked by the sound. Yeah. Um, the combination of the noise you hear from the structure impact against the barrier as well as the, you know, airbags deploying and other things happening uh, is, is really a little, you know, uh, blood curdling. Disconcerting. And, uh, yeah, I don't know how you can do it. I mean, I see these things and I want to walk home. You know, it's yeah. just, I don't care if it's 25 miles, I'll just walk. It, you know, uh, <laughs> it, it, and I've, I, you know, we do a, a bring your kid to work day every year and we always do a crash for the kids. And um, I mean, on many occasions I've had kids start crying, uh, you know, being scared, being frightened. Um, and, you know, I, I certainly don't want to frighten them, but right. we certainly want to impress on them, you know, uh, the importance of, of automotive safety, even when you're just... Wear a, your seatbelt. Wear your seatbelt. Always wear your seatbelt. Chuck, thanks so much for coming on the show, and especially yeah. bringing your, your smashed-up MDX with you. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it was, it was great to be here. You guys, if you're ever down in uh, Raymond, Ohio, just stop by, and uh, we'll show you around. You'll, you'll rustle up a crash test for <laughs> we'll us. We'll find huh? something. Yeah, there's a parking lot full of cars out there. <laughs> so. And Brent Snavely, great seeing you, man, and great thanks to see for you. all your input. Yeah, Appreciate really good it. Stuff. Great to be on the show. Gary, great being with you. Thank Let's you. do it again next week. Okay, we'll do that. Real good. I want to remind everybody, uh, you can listen on your daily commute to all the great AutoLine products via Bluetooth in your car, or even if you don't have that, all you need is an aux jack for your stereo. And of course, you can subscribe to us on your smartphone via Stitcher, the Apple Podcast app, or by visiting AutoLine.tv. Just to have you think about us even more conveniently than before. Thanks, y'all, for having tuned in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone. Your journey, our passion. Visit our website, autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern. Get your daily news fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with AutoLine this week. There's all that and much more at AutoLine.tv.